Good evening, everyone. Welcome to lesson 48 of Comics Connection. I know because this is a class that we have actually opened up to the public, there's quite a few new people joining us this evening. So what I'm going to do while everybody is filing into the room and getting themselves comfortable, I will go through the a little bit of the ground rules so that nobody is confused as to what's going on. As I said, this is going to be Lesson 48, which is part of a regular series of classes that Comics Connection offers, but you do not hear, have to hear the classes in sequence. In comic book terms, this is, these are basically standalone issues. It is not one giant crossover, so you're not missing anything from before. Don't worry about it. Uh, because we have so many people who are in the group this time, the way we usually do our Q&A sessions with the voice and everything else, we're going to forego that and I'm going to ask everyone to keep their cameras off and their microphones off so we don't get any background noise, but we will have a, um, we will let open up the floor for chat when the time comes after the initial presentation. So if you have questions, please type them in the chat and I will get to them as soon as the main part of the program is over. So now that I've done all that, we're going to get started. Now, before I actually go into the program, I will give you a little bit of background as to who I am and what it is that we do at Commerce Connection so you understand why it even makes sense to listen to me in the first place. My name is Gamal Hennessy. I am an attorney author and business consultant who specializes in the comic book industry. I have worked for very large companies like Marvel and Viacom and companies like that, mid-range companies like AWA, Mad Cave, Aftershock, Coffin Comics, companies like that, and um, individuals who are just starting out with their comic career or they are working on their first few comics and getting their business and legal situation set up. Comics Connection is the organization that I help run with another colleague of mine, Andy Schmidt, to help people build creative and business models for the comics that they want to create. So anything that you need to learn about making comics, producing comics, selling comics, understanding how all of those different processes work and how the industry changes over time from a week to week basis is something that we do at Comics Connection on a regular basis. So this class specifically, we're gonna be talking about what it means to make a living in comics. And in general, that's gonna be quitting your day job to make comics full time. We'll get into specific details about what that means according to various different business models in a minute. But I, what I want you to remember as I'm going through this presentation, is there's one thing that I want you to understand, one thing that I want you to remember. You have to understand that you have a lot of different options when it comes to working in comics and a lot of different decisions that you can make to maximize your comic book career. So the key to making a living in comics is to pick those options that make the most sense for you. The second thing that you need to remember, and this is the most important, that I am not attempting to tell you not to make comics. I'm not telling you to give up on comics. I'm not telling you that you need to be homeless or that you need to be a starving artist or that you need to be any of those things. What I'm trying to do is give you the perspective so that you make better decisions about the career in comics that you would like to have. Okay, so when we're talking about making a living in comics, we really need to break that down into two specific segments. One is the making a living part, and the other is the comic book part. So first, we're gonna start with the idea of what it means to be making a living in comics. In general, Comics, like I making a living in comics is, like I said, about quitting your day job and then going into comics full time. So if you're going to do that and you're going to quit your day job, what is it that you have to do to get that, get that money that you need for that career? 
what you see on the screen is the average amounts that of money in 2021 that a household needs to make to have a to be able to pay all of their bills in a comic book in general. This is, has nothing to do with comics specifically, but in general, how you go about making a living. Now, these numbers do not actually include things like other types of insurance beyond health insurance. It doesn't include current debt. It doesn't include any of those other things. These are just purely the numbers that you need to get through any particular um, any particular household income. Now, those incomes are going to change from one person to the next, depending on what your situation is, where you live, and a lot of other different factors. For example, I live in New York, which means my rent is higher, my recreation is higher, my food is higher, my tax, everything is higher because I live in New York. But the because I work remotely, I my transportation cost is almost zero. So every one of these numbers is going to change. And for you, the numbers will also change. But these are the benchmarks that you initially need to be aware of. Now, when you break that out into actual households, the average household income in the United States is about $75,000. And if it's a two-person household, then each individual would need to bring in at least $37,000, $38,000 to make the system work. If you break those numbers down on a average weekly basis, you're talking about a little more than $720, which means the average per month is going to be about $3,000. And that number is going to be significant because it is going to inform a lot of the other numbers that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Now that you've actually, we've wrapped our head around making a living in general, let's talk specifically about what it means to be in the comic book industry. Unlike, you may hear people assume or conclude that making a living in comics means selling comics in a comic book shop. That is one aspect of the comic book industry, and it is an important aspect of the comic book industry, but the comic book industry is actually a much broader system that includes a lot more, a lot of different facets. So in general, in Comics Connection, the way we define it is the comic book industry is any, includes any business that makes at least a portion of their revenue from the existence of narrative sequential art. Now, I'm assuming that most of the people on this call are creative people who actually want to make comics. So a lot of what we're talking about in making a living in comics is going to be dealing with what we refer to as the direct methods. But I wanna actually cover the indirect methods because they are, they actually generate far more income relative to the entire comic book industry, even though they, as the name suggests, they don't actually create comics at all. So the way these three methods, the indirect methods are broken down is based on their relationship to the people who own the comic. So in a licensing situation, you are making goods or services or experiences related to comics and you got permission from the people who own the comics to do so. So whether you're talking about clothing, or merchandise or toys or video games or film or anything like that, there are billions and billions of dollars coming out of licensing programs. And none of those companies, whether you're talking about Funko or any kind of movie studio or any kind of video game studio, they're not making comics. But if you take the comic books away, these businesses cease to function in large part because there's nothing to make their stuff about. Licensing makes far more money than comic books do directly. So it's important to actually include that whenever you're talking about the comic book industry overall. By the same token, investing is making money from the existence of comics, but you never have to ask the comic book creator for permission to do what it is that you're doing. So if you invest in 
Discovery or if you invest in Disney, you are in the comic book industry because you are making money off of their business. You never had to ask them. If you start a comic book convention, you open up a comic book shop, you provide services to people who make comics, all of those businesses are in the comic book industry, but they don't make comics and they don't ask anyone who's making comics for permission to do what they do. Conglomerates is actually the sum total of all the different types of comic book businesses that exist. That's going to be your Disney. That's going to be your Warner Brothers. That's going to be those companies that have so many business lines coming out of creating comics that in large part, the comics themselves become the foundation of the business as a whole, but they are not the most important part because they do not generate the most revenue. Now, before I actually get into what the direct methods are and how you go about making a living, I would just like to point out that I made these slides from PowerPoint and there's a design function that suggests all these pictures. I do not know why the why Microsoft decided that conglomerate needs to be like a monster. Either it's because conglomerates are monsters that destroy everything that's in their path, or they decided that conglomerates are a dinosaur that no longer has any real function in modern living. But I just wanted you to point out that I didn't, I didn't decide that. Microsoft decided that. So if you're talking about direct methods of making a living in comics, there are basically three of them. They are defined by the relationship that the business has to owning the intellectual property of the comics. For our purposes, the intellectual property simply means the characters and the story. So if there are three methods of making a living in comics, the first one is independent publishing. This is where the publisher actually owns all of the intellectual property that the company produces. So making a living here means that you have to sell enough comics to cover both your expenses and the cost of publishing comics on a consistent basis. Now, the cost of actually producing, printing, shipping, storing, and dealing with comics varies from book to book, from year to year. But we like to use the benchmark of $10,000 as a round number to cover all of those costs, because if you're talking about a 22-page comic, $10,000 to produce, print, ship is not beyond the realm of possibility. Now, if you take that $10,000 and the $3,000 that we talked about earlier, then you have a total of $13,000. That's what it costs to make a living as an independent publisher. But the challenge there is you have to not only create the comics, you have to run all the other aspects of the business. And that $13,000 that you generate you're going to have to generate that money on a month-to-month -month basis because your bills are going to keep coming. Now, for anyone who has actually been producing comics at any on any level, you realize that if you're publishing independently, you don't have a huge machine behind you. Publishing enough comics to cover not just the cost of the comics, but the cost of your living on a month-to-month -month basis is a challenge if you do not have the right system in place. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have what's called freelance publishing. This means that you are creating comics for individuals and you will not own those, what it is that you produce. You're producing comics on a work for hire basis. So it doesn't really make a difference to you whether or not the comic does well, or even whether or not the comic comes out, because if you set up your business in the right way, you get paid up front. So making a living in freelance comics means make, generating enough work to cover your expenses on a consistent basis. Again, we talked about $3,000 a month being kind of the magic number. In this case, that's all you have to generate, $3,000 a month to actually make a living in comics. But the caught challenge here is you have to be able to find enough clients to give you enough work on a consistent basis to the point that you are covering both your work and your lost labor. 
lost labor is all of the things that you have to do to run a freelance or independent business that you don't get paid for. So going out to look for work is something that you have to do and spend time on, but you don't get paid. Chasing people down for money is something that you have, you may have to do, but you don't get paid for it. Your own professional development, taxes, all of these other things are legitimate aspects of your business that you have to take care of, but they're not covered. You're not, no one's paying you for it. So when you charging a fee, you have to actually cover all of the unpaid hours, as well as all of the hours that you actually spend working for your clients. The third type of publishing that you can make a living from directly is what's called creator-owned publishing. Creator-owned publishing kind of sits in between independent publishing and freelance publishing in that you come up with an idea for a comic and at a certain stage of the book, whether it's just at the pitch stage or all the way at the end when you have a finished book, you bring that book to another publisher and you work out a deal with them so that they publish the book and take care of some of those business aspects in exchange for some part of either the revenue from the book or the ownership of the intellectual property of the book or both. Now, making a living in, in creator-owned publishing means earning enough from either the advance or what's called the royalty to cover your expenses. Now, the way creator-owned deals work, creator-owned deals actually vary wildly from publisher to publisher. But the getting a cost, the amount, making enough to cover your cost of living means generating enough money, which in this case may be as much as $13,000 because some creator-owned publishers are actually asking the creator to underwrite the cost of the book either upfront because the publisher is asking you to pay for it or they're, they're covering the cost of the printing, shipping, production, or whatever, but they're recovering that cost before they pay you any royalties, which means, again, those books that you produce are going to have to generate around $13,000 a month for you to actually be able to make a living. Now, any, the problem here is twofold. One, it is not it's not necessarily easy to get a creator-owned deal for one book especially an ongoing title. Some people spend two, three, five years looking for that first deal. And there's no guarantee that there's going to be enough money or even any money coming from those deals, especially on a consistent basis, because the publisher is not going to pay you as soon as the money shows up. The publisher may wait four months, six months, or a year and hold on to your money before they give it to you, which means you're going to have to find some other way of actually making it through that time period before you get paid for the book. Now, the beautiful thing about comics is that you are not actually locked into any one method for your entire career. You could, depending on the stage of your career or depending on the individual book you happen to be working on, choose one or more methods to actually get you through your career. So you could start off working freelance to get your feet wet and make a name for yourself in the industry. And once you have a following, because you rode the coattails of a pre-existing property, you could then go out and get a creator-owned deal that is actually fairly lucrative, even if you have to wait a longer period of time to get paid. And then once you've actually established enough credentials, enough reputation in the industry, you could turn around and then start your own publishing company and create intellectual property for that company. This, is, this pattern has been done multiple times, but you can also, within any given year, decide one book that you're working on is going to be a freelance deal gig, one book you're going to pitch to be creator-owned, and another book you're going to publish in-house because that's, you want more control over that book. Making a living here means actually drawing from multiple revenue streams at the same time, but the challenge is the challenge of time and organization. Because if you have too many things going on at once and then you start to miss deadlines, then instead of getting multiple revenue streams, you may wind up getting none because you have actually 
you've dropped the ball in one respect or another. So now that we've actually talked a little bit about what it means to make a living, what the comic book industry actually is and how you can actually make a living in those broad models, I'd like to talk a little bit about the specific roles that are available in the overall comic book industry. Um, in a similar manner to movies, most of the time in comics, it's the writer, the artist, and the publisher that get the most press, get the most screen time, if you will. But if you've ever sat through a MCU movie to see the end credit scene, you know that there are hundreds and hundreds of other people who also work on the book to make sure that things happen the way that they need to happen. Comics is the same way, but on a smaller scale. There are two sets of people that are involved in the production of any comic. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's all of these people are separate people in any given comic because depending on the size of the operation, there may be one or more people that has several jobs, but the jobs break down this way. The editor is in charge of the overall management of the production of the book. The writer writes the script, artist draws the pages, inker actually inks over the pencils that the artist creates, the letterer puts in the words, the flatter creates the base color that the colorist then goes in and enhances and everything is wrapped, the final pages are wrapped up by the production designer. On the business side, you have the accountant who takes care of the numbers, the advertiser who gets the word out about the comic to the, um, to the public, the distributor who actually makes sure the comic reaches the public in the first place, the legal individuals who actually represent the business and legal needs of the company, the marketing person who actually creates the relationships with the broader um, target market and readership, the print production manager who handles the physical creation of the book, the publisher who oversees everything and has ultimate responsibility, and the sales individual who, has, who actually needs to translate the book into money. The key about the business team, especially if you already have a day job, is that if your job during the day actually covers one or more of these factors, you can actually apply these skills to the comic book industry, either for your own book or for someone else's book. Larger companies like a Marvel or DC have all of these business functions in-house, but smaller publishers, and there are hundreds and hundreds of smaller publishers in North America and scattered throughout the world who may need these services on a temporary or a la carte basis. If you did this work, in addition to the creative work that you did for any particular publisher on a freelance basis, that could enhance the amount of money that you can make overall. Now let's actually look at the question that was raised in the initial discussion. How is it that you can make a living in comics? Now, if you look at the average American worker, I believe in 2021, they were making about $56,000. Based on the research that I've done and the reports that I've seen, the average comic book artist is making about $36,500. Now, if these numbers are current and accurate, and they're from a few years ago, so they may not be specifically accurate as of today, but there is a consistent income deficit of about $30,000 a year if you're attempting to purely have, make a living from comics. But that is not the end of the story. Because the way to understand working in comics from a professional business standpoint is to understand your levels of income relative to your expenditure. The chart that you actually see on your screen now looks at how much you're actually making from comics and categorizes it based on how close or how far away you are to making a living. At the hobby level, you are actually putting more money into comics than you are coming out. So if we look at that $10,000 number that we use as a baseline, if you spend $10,000 to get a comic book out the door, 
and you make $5,000 off that comic, you have what we refer to and what the IRS refers to as a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with having a hobby to make comics. It's an awesome hobby to have. But if your goal is making a living from comics, this is a challenge because you have more money going out the door than you have coming in. If you actually get to the number where the amount going out the door and the amount coming in are the same, you will have reached, in accounting terms, what is called break even. So you spent 10, you got 10, and there's a comic book that you created and your, your readers got it. So every dollar after that break even is some level of profit that will get you closer to that theoretical ideal of making a living in comics. If you get from, let's say, $10,001 to the about $60,000, looking at the numbers that we looked at before, you are what is known, what we like to refer to as the investment level. That means you're putting money into a business and more money is coming out than you're putting in, but it's not enough for you to quit your day job. This is not an uncommon situation. There are millions of people who have money in the stock market, but they're not making enough money from the dividends of the stock to actually stop working. Some people invest in real estate and they flip houses or they get you know, investment properties and whatever, but the money coming in from those properties is not enough for them to just stop working. Comics in this, at this level is kind of the same thing, but it's better because you're actually making comics. To go past the $61,000 level, to get to that point where all of the money that you're spending on comics and all of the money that you need to live is actually coming from the comic book businesses that you have, now you are in that career level. And that goes from anywhere from 60 to $120,000, depending on how much money you need to survive and how much money you're actually spending on getting comic books out the door. The level, any level above that is what I refer to as the enterprise level, because now you have enough money for your comic books to be created. You have enough money to live and there's money left over so that you can start to do other things like expand the business, like get into other businesses. And this level is not, it is not beyond the realm of possibility. If you look at your Raina Telgemeier's or your Joe Posada's or dozens and dozens of other individuals in comics, they have reached that level and higher levels than that. But it is, I believe, and this is anecdotal because a lot of people are not sharing their income about the business that they're in in comics. Once you get outside of Comics Broke Me or a lot of the stories that come out on a fairly regular basis, unfortunately, I believe the vast majority of people creating comics are attempting to have a career, a career level, um, career level business when they have investment level income. And the problem there is the relationship between time and money. Now, when I talk about investment time, I'm talking about any work that you do that is not like a full-time job. So if you have extra hours at night or on the weekends that you devote to any particular business, that is investment time. You might decide to call it a hustle. That's fine too. But if you have, you're spending investment level time and you're making investment level income, then that's fine because you are, what you're putting in, in terms of your time and energy is the equivalent of what is coming out. You cannot live off of that, but it is not necessarily detrimental to you and your life. At the same time, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, if you're spending career-level time, which means you're spending 40 hours or more a week on that business, but you are also generating career-level income, this is also fun because you are being compensated for your work in a way that allows you to make a money, make, make a living from the comic book industry. Now, the golden point, the point that I think is this going to be the sweet spot for everyone, is if you are able to spend investment level time and you are generating career level income, 
this is the situation where your books, your catalog, if you have a substantial catalog, is generating revenue to the point where the book is already out and it's still making you money, enough money for you to have a full-time career, but you're not necessarily pounding the pavement 40 hours a week to get that income. There's different ways to do that depending on the business model that you do, but that's going to be, you know, the pinnacle of what, what it is that's going on because you're making more money than you are using in time. The situation that I would like everyone to avoid is where you are spending career level time and you are only making investment level income because that means you are struggling to make ends meet. It's going to lead to burnout. It's going to lead to frustration. It's going to lead to those situations that Jack Kirby once referred to when he said that comic will break your heart. If you actually look at all of the different business opportunities and you look at the business models and you look at what it is that you can realistically put into comics, you can avoid the career time and investment income situation and get closer to one of the other three more beneficial options. So in closing, what I would like to reiterate from the beginning is that this is not a discussion about how you cannot make a living in comics or how that you should not be in comics or anything along those lines. There are a lot of different opportunities in comics. There are a lot of different models in comics that you can use to actually make a living in comics. And if you look at your situation realistically in terms of time, energy, skill, connection, everything else, you can actually make the decisions that make more sense for you. Now, this is these are the kind of discussions that we have on a regular basis in Comics Connection. Um, we have classes like this every at least four or five times a month. We provide a community for comic book creators, as I said, to build businesses that help them get closer to the goals they have, which may include um, making a living in comics. We also have a Discord that our members have access to, discounts on various services. We bring in interviews from experts in various aspects of the industry so you can learn more about how everything works so you can make better decisions about your comics. And we provide overall support to anyone who wants to be in the comic book business. So if you actually go to the link that I'm going to keep on the screen, while we go to answer questions, you can sign up for Comics Connection. And right now, if you sign up for Comics Connection, you will get the first month free. So now that I've now that I've actually gone through the whole song and dance, hopefully everybody got something out of what it is um, that I said. If anybody has any questions, comments, criticisms, jokes, or anything else, please feel free to type them in the chat and I will address them as they appear. Um, I will ask a general random question. Did any, is, can anybody see my screen right now? Oh, good. Because the first message that I saw was that nobody, the person couldn't see the screen. And I was very concerned that I went through all of that and you were just looking at a blank screen. Um, <laughs> okay, there's one question. At what point should a creator-owned creator incorporate advantages versus disadvantages? Okay, let me explain incorporation in as a general concept and then I will explain the specific question about creator-owned incorporation. The reason that you want to set up a company for your comics is primarily threefold. First, if you set up a company for your comics, which means the company and not you actually owns the intellectual property that you create and hires out the work that you do and pays taxes as a separate entity, is that first, you will actually get certain tax benefits from the company that you create, which means a lot of things that you spend on comics and actually having comics out in the market, you can actually take tax deductions for to 
reduce your tax liability, which means you will be happier at tax time. The second thing that it does is it actually shields you and your personal assets from liability, which means that if something goes wrong with your company and someone decides that they need to come after you, whether that's a lawsuit or something else, the only asset, as long as you run the company the right way, the only assets that they can go after is the assets owned by the company. They cannot go after your house, your car, or anything else, unless those assets are also part of the company, which means you've kind of exposed them. The third thing is it actually creates a much more um, professional persona, professional image, when you're actually out in the world, either trying to make deals with other professional creators, or if you're trying to, you know, convince a group of readers to kind of sign on to your brand and then follow you that way. If you're a creator-owned creator, which means you are trying to get a deal with another publisher to distribute your book, it makes sense to incorporate before you start to pitch to creators. So when you're at the point where you're developing your idea, you're putting your pitch materials together, you're maybe hiring an artist to kind of make these sample pages for the pitch deck, or you're filing the copyrights or the trademarks for your property before you send it off to publishers or agents to get a deal, that's when it makes sense to incorporate. Because once a deal actually shows up, you're going to want the, to sign that deal as a representative of your company. You're not necessarily going to want to sign that deal as your represent as you, because once the money does start to come in and you're taxed on that money, you may have to pay taxes on that without the benefit of deductions and without the benefit of liability protection. So if you're going to if you're going to incorporate, and I usually suggest that comic creators do, if you're going to have a long-term career, if you're just going to make one book, then so you don't have to worry about it. But if you're going to have a long-term career in comics, you're going to make making a living in comics, create a comic book company, and then have everything flow through the company before somebody puts a deal on the table, and which means like before you even hire an artist to kind of work on your pitch, you should already have the company because then the company is going to hire that artist and not you. Um, next question from a pros background, I feel like there's a lot of overlap here. Is that true in your experience? Yes, that is true if you're talking about a creator-owned model, if you're talking about a independent model. The difference between prose creator-owned publishing and comic book creator-owned publishing is that comic book creator-owned publishing tends to be more predatory. And what I mean by that is, if Penguin Random House acquires the rights to your book, they want the rights to your book, the movie rights, the merchandising rights, the Broadway play rights. They don't want those because that's not the business they're in. They're not going to use those rights. So they let you have it. go do whatever you want with it. If you get a movie deal, that's great. They're going to want to know because they want to put that little sticker on the book that says soon to be a major motion picture. But that's it. It's fine. Comic book companies that are creator owned, and this is not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but it is many of, are many of them, are what we refer to in Comics Connection as an IP farm, which means they are collecting as many intellectual properties that they can, intellectual properties that people like you create, and then they go off and try to sell those intellectual properties to production houses and movie studios and everybody else in a way that may or may not compensate you at all. So if you're going to get into comic books and you're going to get into creator-owned publishing and you have a prose background and you're used to your agent negotiating a very straightforward deal with a prose publisher, do not expect the same pattern if you're dealing with a purely comic book publisher. Now, there are some of most of the major publishing prose publishing houses have graphic novel imprints. And in those situations, you'll get the same kind of deal that the prose public, the prose writer would get. But if you're dealing with a publisher that is purely a comic book publisher and they're offering you a creator-owned deal, 
make sure you have someone go over that deal very, very carefully to understand what your rights, revenue, and responsibilities are in relation to that deal, because you might be running into a situation where you are giving away the, all the rights to your comic. And you don't want to do that because it's not, it's not really a cool thing to do. Um, next question. I just kickstarted my first comic, physically published. What next? Well, if you kickstarted your comic and you now you have two options, two or more options that you can go to to decide what you're going to do with that book. Actually, three. I will go through all three. The first is to go and create the next comic to kickstart it because now you are in the business where Kickstarter is your major distribution channel and you are in the business as a independent publisher. You just make another comic, you build off the crowd that you already created and you know, Bob's your uncle, you move on. You could decide as an independent publisher to take that book and then put it into multiple distribution channels, whether that's the direct market, comic shops, bookstores, libraries, direct to consumer, digital. There are a lot of different places you can release that book that you've already done. And the beauty of kickstarting your book first is that a lot of your underlying production costs are already paid for. Every That break even point that I talked about in levels of income, you've probably already passed that. So everything else is going to be pure profit. That's pure investment money. And if you continue to do that with all the books that you do, Kickstarter can be a very strong foundation to get an independent publishing business off the ground. You could also decide, because this is something that has started to happen more and more over the past five to seven years, to take that kickstarted comic and then go to a creator-owned publisher and say, the book is already paid for, I've already had a successful crowdfunding campaign, put it through your distribution channels, and then split some of the revenue with me. That makes sense for the publisher because there's no upfront cost beyond printing the new issues and to putting it through their distribution channel and you've already proven that there is a you have a market for this book but again if you do that make sure that you understand exactly what the deal is and exactly what it is that you're giving up so you are not handing over what could potentially be valuable intellectual property to a company that up to this point has not done anything to help you out um, it should also be mentioned that the open Q and A's also cover the breaking news with within the comics industry and conversations with Grow From There that are very exploitative. Thank you for the shameless plug, Patrick. I appreciate it, and I'll probably you know better you some cash because that was very helpful. Uh, the next question: What is the best way to meet agents to present work to distributors and publishers? Is there a good alternative? Okay, there's two. There's two methods that I have that I have known that you can utilize to acquire an agent. One is the traditional method, which is querying an agent, which means you find you use a book like this, the writer's market, and you figure out how many um, how many agents actually deal with graphic novels and comic books in the genre that you're, that you're working. That will give you a short list of agents. Then you figure out what their submission process is. Then you actually follow their submission project process to the letter and wait for one of them to actually contact you and secure, you, can secure, they can, you can secure their representation. The more, the recent method that I've actually found, a method that has actually worked for me when I kickstarted my comic, is to actually produce the comic, kickstart the comic, and then release it. If your crowdfunding campaign is successful, there are a certain caliber of agents that are actually looking for new clients in the Kickstarter community. So what they're doing is your, your comic is already successful. They know that the type of comic that you're doing actually matches the publishers they work with, and they will reach out to you and offer to represent you. This is the, I don't wanna say the easier method because crowdfunding is actually a job in and of itself, but if you do it that way, you can 
you can save a lot of time and you can actually make a lot of progress in your own efforts to actually get yourself a creator owned publisher without having to wait for a traditional gatekeeper like an agent. So you can go, now these two methods are not mutually exclusive. You can query agents and you know work on a Kickstarter book at the same time in, a hopes, in the hopes of end around a move to get an agent. But again, depending on how much time you have to actually do this and how much energy you have to do this, it may be a big ask to do both, but there are two methods that can, to a large extent, overlap. Um, is there a proper ratio of creating art versus self-promotion and marketing? Well, the system we like to suggest in Commerce Connection, we have several classes that are specifically about marketing, is you take the amount of time that you know that you have to spend on your comic book in total, both the business aspects and the creative aspects. And then you carve out 10 to 20% of that time purely for marketing. And you leave the rest of the time to all the other things that are involved in making and publishing comics that are not marketing. Now, when I say marketing, this means your market research, this means your online marketing, your offline marketing, this means your competitive analysis, all of that should actually encompass about 10 to 20% because you don't wanna get in a situation where you're doing so much marketing that you don't actually have a book and you don't actually have a business, but you've done your marketing enough so that you have a huge group of people waiting to read the book that you haven't made yet because you spend like, you know, 17 hours a day on Twitter or X or whatever they're trying to call it nowadays. So marketing is a very important aspect of comic book publishing, no matter what type of publishing you're going to do, because if you're going to be doing creator-owned publishing, you, I can almost guarantee you that you still have to do the marketing for the book. The creator-owned publisher is not going to be able to or have the resources to market your book better than you can. So if you're doing independent or you're doing creator own, you're still going to have to market the book. Freelance publishing, not as much because again, the book doesn't come out or the book doesn't sell. You already got your page rate, so whatever. But for those two others, spend some time, but not all the time, trying to build up the marketing for your comic. Because if you make a great comic, but you never market it, no one's going to read it, no matter how good it is. Um, say a big publisher wants in on my creations. Well, I have to give up create, creative control to make an honest buck. Well, if you're talking about a publisher, well, there's gonna be the broad answer. There's gonna be the specific answer because of the current climate that we're talking about in the comic book industry and the publishing industry as a whole. If a larger publisher wants a book that you've already made and you've already created a market and you already have a following, then they are more likely going to be comfortable with riding the wave of whatever it is that you created. And then, you know, letting you take that to wherever it's going to go because you've already, you have the leverage and because you have that market. If you have what they think is a promising idea, but it's not fully fleshed out and you don't have necessarily have a track record and you don't necessarily have a huge following, they may, depending on the publisher, want to help nurture that idea, bring it to a place where it makes more sense in their catalog and in their publishing plans. The more they actually have a say in that, however, is usually going to be the more control and potentially the more ownership that they have in the intellectual property itself. So if you come to them with a, a pitch, not necessarily pages or art or anything, and they go, okay, we can flesh this out, make sure that in the contract, you're not in a, what's called a collaboration situation, as opposed to a licensing situation. In a collaboration agreement, the, whoever's working on the book actually owns a piece of the book and then can get a piece of the money, whatever money comes out of that book. If 15 years from now, there's a Netflix show, the collaborators usually get a piece of that. So you can push a fully formed entity, a fully formed IP to a publisher, as long as that IP also comes with a market, 
proven sale and a finished product. The more of an embryonic state that it is in, if a publisher gets involved, they're going to want more of it because they're putting more creativity into it. Um, is it viable to go the Eric July business model, create everything and then pre-sell it directly to your market? The Eric July business, now for all those who are not aware, Eric July actually had, he created a very large following online with a lot of different products and programs and services to the point where he had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people following him on platforms like Instagram and YouTube. And then he actually created a comment. The magic of this model is that it is actually the fundamental to the crowdfunding model. It's basically crowdfunding to a very large degree because the magic of crowdfunding is in the name. If you have a crowd, you will get funding. That's it. If you don't have a crowd, you won't get any funding. Anyone who's run a crowdfunding campaign knows if you're not driving traffic to that platform, whether it's your own platform or it's Kickstarter or Zoop or whatever, it's going to be very hard to generate the revenue. If you start in any crowdfunding campaign, you only get a certain percentage of your overall audience, the overall people who follow you, know you or whatever, only a certain percentage of them will donate or back that campaign. It, I believe Kickstarter's numbers run, it runs from like 10 to 30%. But if you have 400,000 people following you, then 10 to 30% is a huge number, especially if you look at what your backer tiers are and how much you're actually selling each piece for and what connection you have with that group. So if you're looking at that model, and this is kind of, it's, a little bit contradictory to what I said about marketing and creating the book, because again, if you have this, this huge following that you're gen cultivating over years and years and cultivating that following on a platform like YouTube, you're making money off the generating the following anyway. But if you then sell products to that group and that group is huge, that is a way to actually make a living in commerce. It is not necessarily the worst idea in the world. However, Keep in mind that those, the size of that following does not happen overnight. It may take you 18 months, 24 months, 60 months to get that huge amount of people so that when you tap them for that 20, 30%, you get a windfall that actually justifies all the time you put in prior. Um, can you discuss the overlap with comics experience? Yes, I can. For those who are unaware, Andy Schmidt runs a organization called Comics Experience that actually is a 10-year-old organization and focuses primarily on the creative aspects of the comic book business. But last November, Andy and I actually merged the business education that I was providing and the creative education that he was providing and basically made a recent peanut butter cup and just put them both together. So now if you join Comics Connection, you have all of the resources of Comics Experience and all of the resources of the organization that I ran, which is called the Comics Publishing Institute, so that, and we've actually enhanced it with other things as we brought them together, so that if you need to understand any aspect of the comic book business, whether it's writing or it's marketing, or it's taxes, or it's you know production management. It's all available within Comics Connection because we have we have expertise and resources and experts from both sides who can help you with anything that you want. Um, up oh, another Gary. There's an attorney in the chat. I'm very nervous now. Um, question. I've my creator own book coming out from a publisher next year and the shift to full-time isn't likely on the horizon for me for some time, if at all. Would it be fair to say that a vast majority of writers, even those regularly working in the industry, are at investment level in terms of time, if not income? It seems to require a number of successful and prolific writers in, that are in that space. 
Um, Gary, the answer to your question is yes. There is a lot of, there's a lot of writers who are working for the big two, Marvel and DC, who are on high profile books, who have been working at those books for a quite some time and are at a very high level, who routinely, routinely report that they are not making a living in comics. What they are doing is they are generating investment level income because they're working now, their situation is a little bit different from yours because they're working on a freelance basis, but because page rates have not actually gone up in a significant number of years, nowhere near the cost of living and the amount of pages that any one creator is, gets may be reduced, it is difficult for them to make a living without a spouse who's covering the, that deficit that I talked about, the 27,000. If, if your spouse or partner or family member or trust fund or whatever is actually covering the shortfall on a month to month basis that you have from working in comics, that's how these people who are work, again, working on books that you have heard of, even if you're not reading them, that's how they're actually able to survive in an environment that by and large is producing investment level income on the creative side. For a creator owned book, I think that's even more challenging because you just said you had your first book that's coming out from a publisher next year, which means they're going to publish it next year. And then they're going to report the royalties six, nine, 12 months after that. If, and if there's royalties to give you, they will pay you depending on your deal. But if they're still recovering, if they're still recouping the advance they paid you, or if they're still recouping the cost that they get because they're probably paying you on net receipts and not gross or suggested manufacturer suggested retail price, then it could be years before you actually see any royalties at all from that book. And even if you do, I'm pretty sure the first check that you get is not going to cover all of the time that you were waiting for those royalties to come in. So what I would suggest, if you do not have a rich partner or spouse, is that you try your hand at let the creator-owned book come out and let that revenue cycle play itself out as it normally would. But leverage that book that you have coming out to get maybe get yourself some freelance work because freelance work pays on a more rapid cycle. Use that to leverage a bigger crowd in your in maybe an independent book that you can crowdfund because again, you control the time frame there and you have more of an ability to create a situation where you're getting your investment income is growing so that you're closer to that making a living stage. I'm basically suggesting hybrid publishing to you and assuming that you have time to do all this, which you may not. But that's going to be the um, that's going to be the way to kind of supplement that creator own cycle to actually generate more money in the interim. Can you briefly explain angel investors and my responsibility to them? Okay. An, a an angel investor or any kind of investor is a person who actually is going to decide to put money into your business in the hopes of more money coming out later. Remember when I talked about the indirect methods of actually generating money from comics, that would be that method. Someone comes in and they give you, let's say $50,000 to produce this comic because they think that your comic is going to get turned into a movie and they want to get it on the ground floor. Okay, we actually call that the maybe movie model. And I'm not necessarily going to get into that here because there are more questions and I get kind of heated when I talk about the maybe movie model. So I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to say is if you get that kind of investor, that investor is going to want a what's called a return on their investment in a very specific period of time. They may want back the money they gave you three times over within four years. So let's say they gave you $50,000 in three or four years, they're going to be looking for $200,000 from you. You may or may not have $200,000. Then you are going to have what we like to refer to as a problem. 
because the angel investor, that a lot of investors who do not understand the comic book industry do not understand the life cycle of a comic. What they see is they read things like Deadline and The Hollywood Reporter, and they'll say, they'll see this property used to be a comic and now it's a Netflix series. This comic used to, this was a comic and now it made a billion dollars. And they want a piece of that, and that makes sense. But what they don't understand is the last movie that made significant money from based on a comic book, I believe was Gardens of the Galaxy Volume 3, which happened to be a 20, 25 year old property from one of the largest corporations in the world that is riding off of one of the biggest like revenue streams in movie history. It's not just a thing that happened last year or four years from now. There are very few books that have a return on investment in the way most angel investors are comfortable with waiting for. Most angel investors are not willing to wait 15, 20 years to get their money, which is why in many cases, it is difficult to get angel investors to invest in your comic unless the comic has already come out, you already have a proven revenue stream, you already have a huge fan base, and people have already started sniffing around to kind of look at giving you an option purchase deal for your comic. Because what I have found is that people are already are willing to give you money when you don't need them to give you money. When you need them to give you money, they're usually not around because they don't think you're going to be able to pay the money back. If they, if they see money coming towards you, they will like to get in line to give you some money so you can give them some of the money that you see coming in. That may not be the most optimistic view of outside angel investors, but in the comic book industry, we are seeing more and more companies take on angel investor money in the hopes of making these kind of movie related deals and then quickly folding or going into bankruptcy or not paying their creators or their distributors or anybody else because of the situation that I just described. So if someone's willing to give you money for your comic, explain to them what it is they're getting into so that you do not run into that situation. If you haven't yet, go buy Gamal's book, The Business of Independent Comic Publishing. So much great info there. It's daunting at first, but thankfully it's well written and very logical. Can't recommend it enough. Great stuff. I will tell everyone on this call a secret. If you join Comics Connection, one of the things that you get first, the first email, is you get a free copy of the business of independent comic publishing so that you have a initial point of reference for all of the lessons and a lot of the discussions that we have because the book was written in such a way to help you understand and organize your own business in comics from start to finish, from the time that you decide you want to make comics to the point you are leaving your vast comic book empire in your will, everything in between is covered in this book and you get it for free if you join Comics Connection. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying it's a thing. Um, last question, what type of business should a comic creator with a creator owned deal establish? Would it be the sole proprietorship model? Okay, thank you for this question because I could, should have covered it when I got the um, incorporation question, but I didn't because I felt like I was right. So there are several different types of companies that one can create when you're creating, um, when you're creating, deciding to create a company. There is, there are corporations, there are LLCs, there are S corps, C corps, public benefit corporations, nonprofit organizations, so proprietorships, partnerships, and limited liability partnerships, although they don't really apply to making comics. The business form that you should decide to take depends on what your ultimate goals are with the company. If you're planning, for instance, to have your company go public and be like on a stock exchange 40, 50 years from now, you want to make a corporation because you want to have shares that you are going to be able to give to invest, initial investors, to give as stock options to your employees, and do all of those things that 
will make the the transfer from a privately held corporation, which is how it will start, to a public corporation more smooth, and it will make the underwriters and everyone doing the due diligence much more comfortable because you have a C corporation. If you are planning to actually hold on to the company yourself or sell the entire company to another company, then I usually find that it makes more sense for people to set up a limited liability company that will allow you to decide how you're going to be taxed. It's much easier to set up. It's much easier to manage. And it actually protects you from liability. I would usually I usually tell people to avoid sole proprietorships and partnerships because the amount of liability protection in both of those models is reduced. So that if you are a sole proprietor and you are going out making comics, and then all of a sudden your printer comes after you for like a hundred thousand dollars, and you're a sole proprietor, your printer in that judgment can go after anything that is in your name. Whereas if you have an LLC, and as I said, if you are running it the right way, you're not commingling funds and doing other shady things, the anyone coming after you can only come after the assets held by that company. Now, this is not necessarily the best thing in the world either, because if all of the intellectual property that you create is in the company, that's what they can go after. But at least you're not going to lose your house and your car and you know your dog and stuff like that. So it also, you have to look at what state you're going to create your company in. There are certain benefits in terms of legal protections and fees and costs and everything else that go into setting up a company. So if you if you join Comics Connection, we have uh, resources that we have like a chart that says, oh, this state gives you this, this state does that, this state doesn't have any income tax, this state doesn't have any company tax. So you actually understand, it helps you make a decision on where you're going to incorporate, and if you need help incorporating, we have services that Comics Connection members get at a discount to help you incorporate and help you like go through that whole process. So right now I'm saying you probably don't want sole proprietor, but it's an open question to the other models that you may want to use to build your company. Um, there, that's going to actually do it. Um, I apologize for running over time. It took me a while to get to all the questions because I like to ramble. Um, but if you have other questions that you didn't get to in this, you can find Comics Connection at comicsconnection.net. You can find Comics Connection on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You can email me directly if you have questions about the membership or about the organization or about anything else. But um, Thank you, everybody, for taking an hour of your life to figure out how to make a living in comics. And for all of the members of Comic Connection that are, you know, joined us on this lesson, we will have our regular open Q and A session. Um, we'll have that next Wednesday. That you could bring all of your questions, comments, criticisms, jokes, ideas, and help you actually understand your comics. We'll have that next Wednesday, the way we always do. Until then, the Discord is open. Everybody have a good night and have fun with your comments. Have a great weekend, everybody. Work with all new people. And valuables always come over. Take care, everybody. All right. Take it easy. You too, David. Thanks.